Well, good morning, all. Welcome to Come Good Podcast. It's Monday, March 14th, and I'm uh, really glad to be joined today by Paula Stone Williams. Uh, Paula, uh, so excited to talk with you today. Uh, and we always start with a little chit chat about the weather. So I'm here in Minneapolis. Yesterday was glorious, 41, sunny, and today we op- open the windows to big, fluffy snow coming down and felt sort of winter idyllic. And we talk about the weather, Paula, because it's the one thing we all do have to share. And uh, you know, we, we all we all walk outside with our neighbors into the same weather, so at least we can start on the common weather experience. Uh, you're in uh, Denver, uh, just outside Denver. How's the weather in the Mile High City? Well, I am uh, right outside of Boulder, right about 20 miles from Rocky Mountain National Park. Oh. And um, today, I think the high is supposed to be about 60. Uh, you know, we get 300 days of sunshine a year, which is wonderful. But we have had 15 weeks of snow in a row, which is highly unusual for us here in Colorado. It's not unusual to be 60 one day and 25 and snowing the next, which this winter I've gotten a little bit tired of. But see, people can even argue over the weather because I do not like snow at all. Most people here do. So really, you know, we can argue about anything. It just seems to be uh, specific of the species, yeah. Especially the predictions we can. Well, Paula, uh, there's a lot of reasons I'm glad to talk to you, your your friendship, but also your expertise. Uh, you know, you, you are an author, you are a therapist, you're a pastor, um, you're someone who has transitioned your own uh, gender identity as an adult. And uh, it's important, I think, that we uh, talk today because in the last month, it has felt to me like there have been intentional efforts that have been made public to be very cruel and very restrictive and damaging to transgender people in our society. And as a subset to many other people who seem to fit outside of a norm that others would demand. And this has been going on a long time inside of businesses, inside of churches, inside of, you know, uh, personal relationships and social structures. It feels like it's moved to another level now because it's now reaching uh, the the point of you know statute and law in some uh, places and that's being proposed and all of that seems to be very intentional and one of the things that happens in these kind of moves is that people's voices end up being silenced and while issues uh, th- these are important issues every issue is also a person's lived experience and they don't approach this as an issue they approach it as something they're dealing with in their lives and I think this is an issue that's uh, so so crucial to to share about. So if you'd share a bit of your own story, I know you've written this fantastic book that I recommend to everybody who's thinking about these issues. And I was also thinking about you in particular because you you were a male, you were presenting as a male pastor for a lot of years inside the religious world. So you experienced the world through that that lens, both directions. And now we're experiencing that that same the same world through a different lens and you write about that in in your book as a woman so that that seemed important to me that um there's a lot of people for whom their gender and their transgender experience is new to them and they're young and we were just talking about this before we came on so i'd love for you to share a bit more about that but some of your perspective and to help our, our you know viewers and listeners understand how to think about this and how to talk about it and how to engage in it. Because not everyone has the privilege that I do of having a personal friend like you that I can just reach out to and ask, you know, how do you think about this and how should we engage in this? So, so what do you have for us? Yeah, it really is an interesting and really kind of disturbing time. Um, I do a lot of speaking all over the world but it's not on transgender issues. Most of my speaking is on gender equity, the subject of my first and third TED Talks. But I've been noticing recently in the Q&A, whether it's in Singapore or Paris or Toledo, Ohio, that a lot of the Q&A ends up focusing on the transgender population in that particular part of the world. And of course, here in the United States, there's a lot of concern with what's happening. Just a few weeks ago, I was in a think tank conversation with a television and movie screenplay writers, producers, executive producers, and showrunners, most of whom live on the east or the west coast, and most of whom do not have anything near an evangelical background. And they were asking, what's going on in all these states 
where all these anti-trans laws are happening. And it was a puzzle to them, as it would be to most people on the two coasts. If you live in uh, rural Kentucky, however, where I grew up, uh, there's no puzzle to it at all. Uh, We are heavy, heavy in culture wars. And those of us who are transgender right now find ourselves in the middle of the process. Mm -hmm. I grew up in that world. I grew up in the evangelical world. And I always say, you've talked to one transgender person, you've talked to exactly one transgender person. Everybody's experience is very, very different. In my case, I very freely and frequently say that I believe I come from the borderlands between genders. I live in the liminal space between genders. I don't claim to have a cisgender female experience. I spent a lot of decades as a man and brought a lot of male entitlement with me into my new gender. Nevertheless, I have experienced a lot of prejudicial treatment, including even in the last week, including uh, stuff I received just yesterday. It is a period in which to be transgender in the United States is to be in danger, which is interesting because we're only 0.58% of the population. Mm. So someone might ask, why us? What's happened? And I think it's best if we take the larger historical view and also the anthropological, really sociological view. It's interesting. I I find a lot of... um, power in the work of the late uh, E.O. Wilson, Edward O. Wilson, who taught at MIT and at Harvard and won a couple of Pulitzer Prizes. His first was identifying that the key social unit for the human species Mm -hmm. is not the nuclear family. The key social unit for the human species is the tribe. It's the community. And that was a major shift in the world of sociology. The second Pulitzer Prize came on recognizing that there are nine tribal species. He calls them eusocial species. That's spelled E-U-S-O-C-I-A-L. And those nine species have what Richard Dawkins would call a selfish gene, but they also have a tribal gene, which means that these nine species will sacrifice themselves for the sake of the tribe. And he said eight of the nine species have evolved as you would expect. An enemy comes into the camp, The tribe unites, defeats the enemy, some of the tribe die, but life goes on. He said, unfortunately, the ninth eusocial species has evolved in a way that's not good for the species, the tribe, or the planet. He says, the ninth eusocial species has evolved to believe an enemy is necessary for the tribe to survive. And where no enemy exists, we create one. And he says, of course, that's us, that's humans. He said, we don't get a hold of that. We lose the species and we lose the planet. Mm -hmm. And at this point, right now in the United States, the enemy that has been created is the Mm -hmm. transgender population. Why the transgender population? Because it was the LGB population. And then marriage equality came to the land through a decision of the Supreme Court. Uh, thanks to Justice Gorsuch at the time, which then um, nice. shifted the, the, the enemy to the trans population. And the shifting of it to trans children, I think, is a puzzle to all of us. Well, I, that is that is so helpful. Um, I was talking with uh, someone that maybe we both know, uh, Jonathan Wilson Hargrove, and we were talking about the big pushback that seems to be happening and then last year that came out of the you know the racial awakening of 2020 and the murder of George Floyd and how so much of our society said that's enough and we're not going to stand for it and be silent any longer he talked about how in society and he quotes another writer who coined this phrase that there's uh, like a religious uh, religious meeting callback that happens so you know it's a call and response and when society sort of pushed forward on racial reckoning, there's been this push back, right? To don't allow for teaching of slavery in schools and so on. And our society doesn't move easily. And I was in a conversation with a, a religious leader who runs a, a big religious get together that where they have breakfast in Washington, DC, if you know what I'm saying. And he was saying to me, he said, you know, one of the things so many of our people really struggle with is they don't like it when activists connect race issues, which we all know we need to reckon with, 
to these other social issues like being gay or transgender. And they don't want that linking to happen. So we had a long conversation about why that linking needs to happen and how they're actually part of the same, same social movement and so on. And he was really frustrated. And that gave me some insight into, I think, what you're raising, which is the reason I think trans kids especially are being picked on is one, anytime especially religious people can believe that they're the hero protecting children, they will narrate a story where we all want to do that. We all want to protect kids. You can see it in Ukraine. You see it in our society. You see it in our, our Minneapolis school system is currently on strike right now because the kids are not being treated well enough because of our funding levels. So children are a real motivator. So you can protect the children. And now, as you say, so many of the other issues that used to be organized around for society to have as a, a lesser class or an enemy race or even being gay now that's not acceptable at a very high level that's not acceptable in our society so they move to another and to um uh, start harming children and any or start harming transgender people and anyone around transgender people this is what's been very curious to me, and it seems like, and I'm interested in your thoughts on this, that it's following a very similar pattern, that you don't go directly only after, in this case, transgender people, or say, you know, uh, biracial marriage in the 1950s and 1960s, you go after the people who support biracial marriage, and you go after the people who support transgendered people. So you start to attack the whole system. And I was in in Mexico a couple of weeks ago on vacation, I happened to be chit chatting with a person that was there. And she said, Hey, I'm from, I'm from Iowa. And we're like, Oh, we're from Minnesota. And so we get that little thing, you know, state neighbors. And I said, Oh, and she said, Oh, I'm a, I'm a school special education teacher. I said, well, are you guys on spring break this week? How's that feel? She said, no, I'm actually not. I'm on, I'm on administrative leave. And I said, well, what's this about? And she said, well, I assigned to my eight special ed students, junior high, like ninth grade special ed students, a book that included a transgender character. And the parents went crazy. They had school board meetings and the superintendent wanted me to take a couple of weeks off while they figure out what they're going to do. And they just, she said, I just heard yesterday that they're going to move me to a different school. She's essentially been silenced and fired and moved out as a special ed teacher who just assigned a book that had a character in it. And these parents uh, went, went um, you know, so, so aggressive on her. So that's what seems to be happening. And, and what, all right. So, so any thoughts you have about that or, or what do you think we should do about this? Because it feels like there's a very sophisticated response, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, viral like response to transgendered people right now um, that uh, is taking a lot of lives and, and harming a lot of people. First of all, you know, trans kids um, and then these, you know, the governor of Texas and the governor of Florida saying they're protecting trans kids somehow, you know, and telling parents they're going to criminalize their behavior and call it child abuse if they support transgender ex expressions from children. Uh, it's just, it, I don't know. What do you think? Again, I think Wilson was right. Um, it is the creation of enemies that don't exist. And if you want to see where it's coming from, you have to look at the power structures themselves. You consider the work of Rene Girard. Uh, Girard yeah. was an anthropologist and a philosopher who studied systems of power, mimetic theory, he called them, and discovered that those in power want to stay in power. And they discovered one of the best ways to stay in power is to identify themselves as the only person who can identify the enemy within, the enemy inside the gates. And so, well, you really can't let me out of power right now because I'm the only one who actually can tell you who the true enemy mm -hmm. is. And so it's a way for those in power to remain in power. I find it kind of interesting that many of those who are leading this charge uh, have chosen actually two subjects as their major social issues over the last 50 years. And that would be uh, a woman's right to choose and the LGBTQ plus population. And I find it interesting that the world that is in opposition to both of those things is in fact a purely patriarchal, 100% male driven world. So if in fact I'm a man and I'm in charge of a particular segment of society and I wanna choose a social issue, um, I could choose a social issue that might cost me something. Let's say racial reconciliation, a systemic racism or socioeconomic injustice, or I can choose a subject that costs me personally absolutely nothing. 
a woman's right to choose and LGBTQ plus issues. So what you have is those in power conveniently choosing social issues that cost them absolutely nothing, which again is just a continuation of both what Gerard and E.O. Wilson have told us. And it's interesting that the people driving this more than any other, and this is an unfortunate reality, it's not a group of political conservatives. Uh, in mm -hmm. fact, uh, two studies done not terribly long ago, uh, right after the 2020 election, found that 61% of Trump voters, one of the studies was 61% of Republicans, the other was 61% of Trump voters in the 10 swing states. But in both of those cases, 61% of those who voted for Trump felt that transgender people should have the same civil rights as everyone else. Mm -hmm. So if it's not conservative Republicans who are driving the agenda, yeah, who yeah. is it? Who is it? Yeah. So there, we, yeah, there we can take a look at the uh, Pew's uh, research study, which indicated that 84% of white evangelicals believe that gender is immutably determined at birth. 61% of them believe that we already give far too many civil rights to transgender people, and yet only 25% of whom have actually met someone who's out as a transgender person. So make no mistake about it, it is the religious right that is driving this agenda. If you take a look at it, all three of the desert religions, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, all three Abrahamic religions began as religions of scarcity, understandably, because they began in the desert. Yeah. And in their more generous forms, they've grown beyond that. But in their fundamentalist forms, all three remain mm -hmm. religions mm -hmm. of scarcity. So there have to be those who are in and those who are out. And right now, those who are out is focused on the most vulnerable population in the United States. Transgender children have a 13 times higher suicide completion rate than their peers. And of course, as you were saying, the target is not just the kids themselves, it's their parents and their healthcare providers. And it's the simple reality of creating an enemy that doesn't exist. There are um, laws that have been passed now, and 17 laws that have been passed in seven states. Uh, there are over 160 laws pending in 30 states, 40 in Texas alone. And almost all of these are being driven by evangelical Christians in middle America. That's why folks in Boston and San Francisco, um, Seattle and New York don't understand what's happening. Uh, but it is in fact coming out of that conservative religious environment. And it's important to say at this point, I imagine a fair amount of your audience is, at least has a background in religion, but it's important to say that I am a pastor Right. And I actually do Me believe too. that religion is good for our species. You know, I love the work of Jonathan Haidt, who discovered that as a species, we did not take off. And this is also a Wilson finding. We didn't take off when we remained at the level of blood kin. We took off as a species when we became the level of tribe. So what is it that brought us together as a tribal species. And people say, the assumption is that what brought us together as a tribal species was our need for safety. Mm -mm. What brought us together was man's search for meaning. So think Stonehenge or the carved figures of Rapa Nui or the burial mounds of indigenous Americans. You know, what brought us together as a tribal species was our common search for meaning. Religion on the whole has been good for our species. The problem is the fundamentalist expressions of the desert religions. And right now, the enemy they have chosen, again, creating an enemy that doesn't exist mm -hmm. as a way to retain their power in their environment. It caused me to think of two things. One, you know, one of the great attractions to me of the Jesus teaching and of then to my mind as a 16 year old kid when I ran into Christianity with no real background in it was not just Jesus saying to love God because I figured that's what religious people would do and really not even say love your neighbor because I don't know like everyone gets that there, there was this unique insight where Jesus said but your enemy also needs to be included in your love action right so rather than Jesus saying don't have an enemy, which is what a lot of us say today, right? Like what I want to be is somebody that just lives at peace with everyone. I don't want to have enemies. 
I don't know, maybe it was an insight or maybe it was just sort of taken as a given. There was this teaching that seems powerful from Jesus's uh, way that said, no, you're going to have enemies, whether you've chosen them or they've chosen you, that you got them, but treat them the same as you would treat someone else. So don't fuss with the category. And here's what I want to ask you about, because as a pastor, both of us, we've just deal with a lot of people and their thinking and their, their, their life change and everything. Very few people believe that they're acting because they've created an enemy. They, they don't even like if they heard this conversation and I'm sure some people who feel the way about transgender uh, folks that, um, you know, the religious right wants them to think are listening to this and they will listen to it. They'll say to themselves, you guys are just characterizing like they're not I, I don't th- see him as an enemy. It's not about them being my enemy and they will become, you know, aggressive in trying to defend the fact that they're not making an enemy. Uh, instead they're responding to a moral issue or th- there's something else that's driving them. So our ability as human beings to narrate a story by which we are the victim and not the perpetrator on a weak enemy is so consistent. It's almost as if human beings say, look, there's always three characters. You know, there's a hero, there's a victim, and there's a perpetrator. And somehow we always end up as either the hero or the victim, right? Very rarely does somebody say, you know, this is what AA and other, other you know, kind of um, awakening movements have said to people is, you should probably take an account of the way you've harmed someone else. Like, get that, get that in your head and get that straightened out. Because our ability to not see ourselves as the perpetrator, but as the victim or the hero, that's where people find themselves. Having a school teacher fired, getting a book removed, having a trans teacher removed, having a kid, you know, be told that that's not how God made you. They really see themselves as the hero or the victim. Um, What do we all do when we're looking at someone here? I'm asking for your pastoral advice. When you're looking at someone who seems clearly to be the perpetrator and yet they see themselves a perpetrator of a harm and they see themselves rather in this other image as the hero or the victim. You know, one of the myths that's been around for the last 500 years or so in the Western world is that we as a species are more interested in the truth than we are in belonging. Hmm. And yet the truth is that never has that been the case. We have always been more interested in belonging than we have been in the truth. Uh, I'm a pastoral counselor by trade. That's what my doctorate is in. And I'll have clients who will be coming to grips with the fact that they were abused by a family member and they're ready to confront that perpetrator. And so they will say to me, you know, I know the rest of the family is very aware of exactly what happened. So they'll back me up in this. And I hate to tell them, well, actually, my experience is they will not, that you'll be on your own, because in your family system, more than likely, belonging in that system is more important than the truth. To be able to, and and then unfortunately, I'm generally right, to be able to stand up for the truth, we get to the other thing. Jesus said. In fact, I find it fascinating that it's the last public answer he ever gave to the last public question he was ever asked. Which of the laws is the greatest? He said to love God, love your neighbor, and the hardest of all, to love yourself. Hmm. If you are not able to truly love yourself, you will not be able to also see your responsibility as a person who can choose the truth or who can choose the more comfortable path of belonging. If we have a strong ego structure, we can choose the truth. If we have a weak ego structure, we will choose belonging every single time. And so I think that loving self is a lot of where this Mm -hmm. begins. I think it's also important to recognize that our species operates depending on who you are, where you are, from three different separate moral standards. In the secular Western world, there's no greater moral truth than to look out for the best interest of the individual. That is the moral standard of the secular West, that there's no greater moral imperative than to look out for the best interest of the individual. But there are two other moral standards of our species. Second moral standard is that there's no greater imperative than to protect the integrity of the tribe. Mm -hmm. This has always been the moral standard of most developing uh, civilizations. And then the third, uh, which has no geographical bounds whatsoever, 
The third is that there's no greater moral imperative than to obey the teachings of the gods. Yeah, yeah. And that we don't recognize in the secular West. Um, all those folks who were the showrunners in Hollywood and New York and, and in Western Europe just don't realize that so much of the world still works from that perspective, that there's no greater moral truth than to obey the teachings of the gods. And that those teachings are being dominated by the fundamentalist expressions of the desert religions. Yeah, Which in the United States means most of our difficulty comes from evangelical <laughs> Christianity. You know, if you're in the Middle East, it comes from fundamentalist Islam. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And sometimes those cross currents happen in the in the United mm -hmm. States as well. That that's something that I have heard very often where people will say, Look, I I would love to accept name your group that I'm choosing to exclude, but my faith keeps me from it. Almost as if they're saying my faith is more important. That is the thing, this third moral standard that you've uh, outlined. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that's most important. What, what do you suggest a person does in, because they're going to run into people who are like that, right? There's, there's no doubt that that's, and somehow it can be seen as very pietistic and sort of admirable, right? Where someone says, Hey, look, my faith is so important to me. It's the, you know, it's the thing I would live for. I, I remember talking to a, a pastor named John Piper. Do you know that name at all? You know yes, guy? I do. Oh, yeah. Okay, so, so John passed to church right up, right up the street, and I knew him for a long time, and he was having an event where they were going to say a bunch of things about some of the religious movement that I was a part of and name a bunch of us and call us out for being the problem that they saw us as in the world. So I reached out and said, hey, you know, you're welcome to do that, of course, but it just seems like you should, like, we should chat a bit before you do. And in fact, it would make your argument better if you could say we talked to you, the, you know, I talked to him the other day and, you know, uh, like it really gives great credibility if you can say, here's a friend of mine and here's why my friend is wrong, as opposed to here's an enemy of mine. Here's why my enemy is wrong. You think that'd be better for you? So we went to lunch and um, it was at a, it was at a, a Olive Garden, um, their choice. And I remember sitting over the breadsticks and John looking at me and said, Doug, I've been sitting here listening to you talk. And frankly, I, I can't imagine why anybody would ever want to listen to you preach. You don't seem like you're somebody who would be willing to die for anything you believe. And I just remember looking at him and I said, well, John, I got to tell you, no, I don't think I will die for what I believe. I, I you know, <laughs> I, I believed a lot of things that I really held to that now I don't. I, I think that's not the way to organize my life. I think I should be organized you know, as Jesus was about people and be organized around sort of that uh, maybe second or first category that you listed there that maybe if I was willing to sacrifice at all, but frankly, I think we should move beyond a sacrifice narrative, but no, I'm not going to die for my beliefs. He just could not and went on and on and said, well, this is our fundamental difference. You, there's nothing you hold to that is more important than you. No ideal. And we you know, went round and round and, you know, they ended up having a conference and said lots of things, you know, uh, that they, that they were intending to say, but, but that little insight, which I hadn't really remembered until you just raised this was like that. When I know people who really think highly of, of John and his movement and feel like they're part of it, they almost all say the same thing that my faith is the thing that I would rather hold to. You know, uh, I think of this, there's a song that, 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 group tends to sing this worship song. Oh, wow. This is weird. I'm having this little flashback, this worship song they sing, which comes out of a, I think comes out of a Psalm, uh, a Jewish Psalm, which says, um, better is one day, uh, in uh, it's better. No, it's better to be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tent of the wicked. This kind of idea that's better to be just on the outside of the righteous than to be in with the, you know, with, with the wrong righteous or better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. This kind of thing of like, there's something higher than people that we hold to. And that feels like what drives a lot of our society. Actually, I think it drives a lot of our politics. You know, a lot of people are more committed to their political ideology than the people who are impacted by it. And, um, all right, one, one more little anecdote, and I'd love your response to this. I was at a political event with a bunch of religious leaders the other day, and a, a pastor who's, uh, I don't know, maybe mid-40s, but he's new to being a pastor, and he said, hey, you were a pastor for a long time. What's, uh, what's, what, what's, the, what's the number one piece of advice you have for me as I'm getting started? Because I'd, like you know, I'd like to be a pastor for the rest of my life, you know, next 20, 25 years. And I said, well, um, love, love the people in your church and trust them. And his head popped back and he goes, no, 
really? That's your advice? I said, yeah, I mean, love the people in your church and trust them. And then I started to think like, why is that? I thought that was going to be like, you know, that's nothing insightful. And he was taken aback. He goes, well, I don't, I don't know about that. I know too many of these people very, you know, kind of made some joke about knowing these people. And I don't know, that feels like it's the crux of the difference here is, are we going to be so committed to something, some idea we would die for it? And do we think loving people is sort of the, the essence of, of, I don't know, human flourishing? When I think about the religion in our world and religious communities in our world, um, government exists to take care of the citizenry. Corporations exist for profits for the shareholders. Educational institutions exist to impart knowledge. But the nuclear family and the religious community are the only entities that exist to teach us how to be human together. Mm. And I think religion is the only formal institution that exists regardless of its expression, whether we're talking about the desert religions or the, the religions of abundance you find in the Pacific Islands. It's the only place we come together to search for meaning. Oh. And I think that is such a healthy part of religion. So I love what you said, to love people and trust them, uh, which means that if in fact we're coming together to search for meaning, this is a good thing. Hmm. The problem is in every form of fundamentalism, and there are fundamentalist atheists just as there are fundamentalist Christians, there is a failure of courage. Hmm. The courage to accept responsibility for yourself. It is terrifying to be a free being. It is terrifying to have to recognize that the decisions are mine to make. It is much, much easier for us to give away our freedom to an external source. Mm. And that's why it's so much easier for us to mm. belong than it is for us to focus on the truth of things. It takes great courage to focus on the truth. So when I first transitioned, I thought, you know, I've known these evangelicals forever. I was a part of a large denomination. I was in leadership in that denomination. And I thought, well, the cognitive dissonance will be good for them because they know my character and they will think to themselves, well, I must be wrong about what it means to be transgender because I know Paul's character. And it was fascinating to me that the exact opposite happened, that they thought to themselves, oh yeah, I must've been wrong about Paul's character. Uh, if in fact he's transgender. And I just was so taken aback by that. And I think that for me was again, um, a rude awakening to this reality that we would rather belong than we would know the truth. So cognitive dissonance really doesn't accomplish anything at all. What does accomplish something is love. Yeah. You know, I knew probably five to 10,000 people by name from my old denomination. And I've had substantive conversations with, I think, five of them at this point. Oh, All wow. five of those are people who love extraordinarily well. Hmm. And their, their love for me allowed them to transcend their fear. And it is so fear-based. Hmm. And it's such a failure of courage. And of course, I think the sad part of that is a healthy understanding of Jesus will give you all the courage in the world because you know you're loved exactly as you are. You, being loved is not dependent on believing the right things or a certain kind of behavior. And if you, in fact, recognize you are loved no matter what, then you can have the courage to stand up for the truth wherever you find it no matter how painful it is. You know, I said in my second TED talk, the truth will set you free, but it's gonna make you miserable first. <laughs> and you know, I, I find it's interesting when we were looking for the source of that, well, there are so many places you find the source of that because so many people have intuitively come up with that same truth. That yeah, the truth will set you free, but it's gonna make you miserable first. It's a whole lot easier to allow yourself to be set free when you know you are loved just as you are the true Jesus message. Yeah. So let me ask you a little bit about that community and tribe that you were in for so long. You, you knew that world very well. You helped to create it and to articulate it. You understood it. 
now that you look back, what was going on there that allowed, I don't know, like you say, 4,995 of the people that you knew by name to basically say, boy, I had Paul wrong all along. Turns out Paul was a person of, you know, ill character. Like what do, do you now, do, do you have a, an understanding of what was going on there where, where you thought, boy, no, these people are now going to say, boy, I now have to hold two things in tension and that's going to pull me forward. What caused them to instead say, we need to eject this, this abnormality from our system and bind together sort of in opposition or in quiet resistance or public resistance. What was being taught there? So, that, and, and I ask you that maybe to help other people find their own, clues as to what's being communicated in their world about yeah i think we really do have to take that very wide very deep view that edward o wilson brought to the forefront in the recognition that we are a tribal species and we're the only one of the tribal species that has evolved to believe an enemy is necessary for the tribe to survive and where no enemy exists we create one and I think he's exactly right. He, we don't get a hold of that. We lose the species and potentially we lose the planet. So it's not a bunch of individuals that came to this. It was in fact tribal behavior that brought us this way. We have evolved this way. How do we get a hold of it? You know, that's why I'm still a Christian. I believe there really is only one way to get a hold of it. And it's to recognize that love is what makes the world go round. Mm -hmm. That loving God, which includes the, the God who burst on the scene 14 billion years ago and all of God's complexity, mystery, and ever expansiveness rooted in relationship and grounded in love. And yes, I just defined the Big Bang. But loving God, uh, loving neighbor, which includes your enemy, and loving self. I don't know that we get there any other way. And I think narrative is important. So I'll go anywhere and speak. I get paid big bucks to speak at uh, at corporations and universities, but I actually go to Christian universities pro bono uh, because I think if they get a chance to see me, yeah. that, well, then they have to come away saying, huh, well, actually she seems relatively normal, as normal or abnormal as I am. And that is the beginning of shifting narratives when you don't see that person as a natural enemy. And yet there are limits to that because I know so, so, so many families who have utterly cut off their child oh. for life just because that child is gay. So the desire to belong is unfortunately often the root of the evil and the lack of enough ego strength to stand on your own and to stand firmly with the truth, no matter how mm -hmm. difficult that may be. And the group that you were with, you the, these were these were and are loving people, right? By all mm -hmm. definition, the work yep. they do in the world, how they treat, like the, it's true. They knew you. You were word that had become flesh and dwelt among them, right? You weren't an idea or a concept. Yep. You were a flesh and blood person that had held their hands and cried in you know the settings with them and experienced joy with them. All of those human things, and as you point out people expel their own families or you know as we're reminded from the genesis story the son the sons of the son of god you know cain and abel one killed the other one so family isn't enough you know in fact most violence in our society happens within the family not outside of it so holding both of those realities in tension what what was going on what what is the subtext that so many of us hear and might not even know that would say the person you had such leadership trust in and such personal admiration for, you can so quickly turn on and get rid of. And I don't, I don't mean to only blame the religious narratives. I mean, all the versions of cancel culture do this same thing, right? Like it's amazing how fast we can be. And, and I feel this very directly. Like I can't watch Bill Cosby stuff. You know, I have still Bill Cosby jokes going through my head. And when, when I hear them, you know, if I see chocolate cake and I remember back to that little bit from his comedy thing about making chocolate cake, I'm just like, I can't do the chocolate cake thing in my head. I don't know why, like, I'm not willing to spend time and energy dealing with that right now, but it just feels off to me. I've just sort of moved him out now and he's 
banished to the further distances of my mind. What's in our world that, and, and what do we do? Maybe more important than what causes that stuff, whether it's in that community that you are in or my own head with Bill Cosby or all the others, what do we do about that? You know, cause we want to narrate as we have here, you know, that there's this love narrative for humanity and trust in one another. And boy, we can just turn on each other and, um, you know, turn into a Cain and Abel story before we know it. Yeah, as I sit right here, I'm looking, I have two places in my room that have the next books that I'm reading there or books I'm currently reading. And um, one of them is John McWhorter's Woke Racism, which is about a uh, third wave of anti-racism mm. and the ways in which it works against it's itself. Again. Say, I'm sorry, um, Paul, I didn't... It's, a, it's John McWhorter, M-C-W-H-O-R-T-E-R, and it's Woke Racism. Okay. Um, nice. He is an African-American, and he's writing about how, in his opinion, um, that world is sometimes its own worst enemy in the way that it speaks about systemic racism. And he's taken a lot of hits for that. And the book has taken a lot of hits for that. But I, I find it fascinating because it, just as you said, whether we're talking about cancel culture in universities, which has uh, become a huge problem, uh, or we're talking about fundamentalist expressions of the desert religions, we tend to brand other as enemy. Hmm. And I don't know any way to mitigate, to fight, to war against that than through narrative and proximity. Hmm. You know, not, not standing across the street from each other and yelling, but sitting on the front porch talking about the weather, you know, I, I think finding that common ground is critical. I, I don't know that we get there otherwise, because more and more we tend to silo ourselves in our culture. And I understand that for my community. I mean, I, you know, if I spend much time in that world, that world hates me. Nice. Um, but I also have enough ego strength as an individual that I can handle what, what the transgender child and the parent of the transgender child cannot handle. Mm -hmm. And so sit down and talk with me and let's talk mm -hmm. about something on which we can agree. Uh, let's talk about the pathetic, pathetic reality that the New York Mets have not won a World <laughs> Series since 1986. <laughs> and yet yeah. we still are fans of the Mets. You know, let, let's talk about something that we have in common that can cause us to see our uh, humanity. Uh, and yet I think even there, um, I can't think of the name of the mountain, but there was a mountain in uh, Italy in World War II that on Christmas day, they had a 24 hour truce. And as people went out to uh, bring back those who in, into the middle of the battlefield to bring back those who had lost their lives, they ended up interacting with one another. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these, these opponents saw the humanity of each other. And yet 24 hours later, um, they were back to killing each other again. Yeah. And, you know, that, that is, um, you know, maybe I'm too optimistic and maybe it isn't. Pollyanna-ish perspective on things, but I actually do believe that when the day is done, it is love that makes the world go round. It's love that yeah. holds all the pieces together. And so I think any way that we can get together and hear one another's narrative, I think that's the only way we can get there. Yeah. Yeah, it is It is so perplexing. You know, I, uh, I think about the this woman who I ran into in, in Mexico and she said, you know, she was fired. Well, she was put on administrative leave and then removed and sent to another school that, that person in that store. Um, she said, and you know what really gets me about this? The parents who raised this ruckus, they were friends of mine. Like, like our ability inside of a system, because I think you're right. The only thing I've ever seen is, you know, Take an idea, manifest it in flesh and blood, and show up. We're going to be we're doing a tour of the country starting this this Saturday, 
uh, around common good immigration and traveling with people who work on the border and bringing people together who can experience someone who's had to deal with our immigration policies because immigration is also a subset of all the rest of this stuff we're talking about, right? But who gets to be included in the inn and, and how do we decide and who gets to decide and who's the lowest level and all this. Um, so I totally 100% agree with that. And uh, the reality is, boy, we turn on one another sometimes even faster than we turn on this on the stranger. Like the greatest wrath that a group gives is when a current member breaks away. We call it being a traitor, like even in our own society, right? The thing you would after the January 6th attack on the Capitol, what people were like is let's let's charge these people with treason because that in our society, you know, I think you get the death penalty or something, right? Like we think that, you know, the highest level of punishment we could ever dole out goes to the traitor, not to the enemy, you know, not, not to the outside enemy. So both of these realities seem like they're, they're in existence here. And I, the, the kids and the teachers and people that are harmed are often harmed so much by those who are so close to them. What, any thoughts on what, how people deal with that, think about that, li live with that, do, respond to that, do something about that? Again, I think that we understand the, the tendency through our evolution as a species. And, and I, you know, I go back to what I've said twice already, um, listening to Edward O. Wilson on Fresh Air a number of years ago, mm -hmm. when he mm -hmm. said, if we don't get a hold of this tendency to make enemies that don't exist, we will lose the species and potentially the planet. And I, I think that's true. Interestingly, I find one of the most effective ways to bring about change is actually, and I've, I've done some work with a group called Pop Shift that is mm. looking to do exactly this. Um, their director puts people from particular minority communities together with showrunners, uh, um, screenplay writers, producers, executive producers. And just to talk about, you know, how should your community, whether it's a community of individuals with disabilities or whether it's um, the transgender community or um, a, a racial minority, um, what what would you say to these writers, directors, et cetera? Because if you take a look at what made the shift in the United States on LGB stuff, more than anything else, it was the television show Will and Grace and the television show Ellen. You know, it, it was a story and how that story was told. And we're seeing the same thing happen now in the trans community. I say to these showrunners all the time, the best thing you can do is have a trans character be just a character in the show. Don't make the fact that they're transgender mm. a part of the narrative. My major uh, subject on which I speak is gender inequity. And because of that, I have all kinds of people who will come and listen to me speak yeah. who would never come and listen to me speak on transgender issues. But gender equity is a much more mainstream conversation mm -hmm. to have. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that I'm trans kind of comes in through the side door, but of course has a lot of good done for the trans community. So I think, you know, just like that language we used to use in the world we came from overhearing the gospel, I think overhearing the narrative of acceptance in a secondary way uh, actually accomplishes more good than in a primary way. Mm. Uh, because in that primary way is where we get that immediate uh, pushback uh, because, yeah. oh, wait, no. It, I mean, my belief system and and belonging to my tribe is actually more important than my own freedom. Yeah. yeah you think about side-by-side -side relationships versus face-to-face -face or head on head to head i'm right. reminded of this, of this phrase maybe you uh, know know it or where it comes from but uh well it's a notion that social acceptance of an outside group or idea has these four stages what one is that the dominant culture first ignores you no one knows you exist then they fear you or then then they laugh at you then they fear you and only finally do they accept you and boy, you can look at some social issues that sort of follow that that kind of pattern. And I, I, don't know, I think maybe you and I have maybe talked about this once because I kind of remember that thinking transgender expressions 
kind of follow some of that, right? Like, is that really a thing or, uh, don't, don't, don't look at that. Don't, don't talk about those, like, just, just leave them be, you know, put, put it into a psychological category, put it on the DSM four as something, you know, like mash or something. And then, then you can laugh at it and sort of be okay. And now we're in the fear stage that it's, you know, people are like, Hey, it's not, it's not funny anymore. Or these, you know, the, the, the runway shows and, and, you know, uh, 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 the popularization actually is raising the fear. The same thing happened with, with gay and lesbian people in our society. There was all kinds of ignore, laugh at, and then a bunch of fear and then an acceptance and something pivoted. A lot of people say it was the Supreme court or it was legalization of marriage from the Obama administration or, or like you say, it was just overwhelming normalization, but something did the thing. Do you think that's helpful? Like, should we think of ourselves somewhere, somehow in a pattern that we're in a stage kind of moment and we have to really yeah. work hard to protect kids right now and others who are being harmed? Um, and I think and what to, takes us from that stage of fear to that stage of acceptance is again, the side by side. If I can see it on a screen, that's a little bit easier for me to deal with than if I have to see you um, face to face in an oppositional way, you know, if, yeah. uh, I think that's why uh, television, you know, I, I think about, you were talking about uh, those on the border and immigration in the United States. And I think one of the absolute best things you can give to uh, somebody from the middle America um, is uh, one of Luis Alberto Urias novels, mm -hmm. uh, which are all speaking about Mexican American culture. And they're wonderfully written, and you find the humanity in these stories as opposed to uh, the enemy in these stories. And so I, I think that novels, movies, television shows, I think these are a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. And then that side by side, uh, or eventually face to face, where you're able to have those conversations about the weather, and then eventually those conversations yeah. about of the essence of who you are, but it, it, you know, it just takes a good long while to get from that fear stage to the acceptance stage. And that's, that's where we are yeah. right now. I mean, as you know, since 2016, yeah. we're in a dangerous, dangerous place, not just in the United States, but all over the world in yeah. the emboldening, uh, emboldenment of um, uh, hatred. Yeah. Yeah, we are. And, and look, I mean, I have a desperate need to be, have a positive view toward the world. So that might be where this is coming from, you know, a, a Pollyanna kind of, kind of view, but it, it I'm with might, you. It, I, uh, yeah, I guess I'm with like you. I think we have to, I think we have to, there's, we must see a way to bridge the divide. Yeah. I mean, if, if, if all, if all worlds are possible, why not pick the one that feels more positive? Um, yeah. that, that, that maybe where we find ourselves, um, is the reason that books are being banned. And we were talking before we came on here that, you know, you know, when trouble's brewing because your book shows up uh, as a woman shows up in a bookstore and then someone bans it and someone gets fired. And then the right wing sort of starts writing things about you that maybe that maybe we're in a stage now with transgender people that is similar to where we were with gay and lesbian kids being killed. Right. And then hate crime laws, started to apply there because we've said you can't hate them and fear them any longer. And that was the next step to acceptance. I think some of the social conservatives and religious conservatives know this as well. I think they know the ignore them, laugh at them, fear them, accept them. And they're nervous that the normalization of transgender issues in our society in schools and with counselors and therapists and religious leaders and having an evangelical pastor like you being the embodiment of a transgendered person freaks them out because they realize this is the, the signs of normalization. And the thing they're decrying is why do we want to normalize something that, you know, breaks, our, breaks our religious life. And it's just another way we're being victimized, right? Somehow these religious people figure out a way to feel victimized by, by this. And it is, well, we, we, we think this is wrong. And because society says it's right, we're now being, we're, we're now the minority that's being victimized and this is our religious freedom. And here we go. Maybe that's where we are though. Maybe we're closing in on the next phase 
even though it feels the most dangerous right now, that we really have to hunker down almost like in a war. And I don't like war metaphors because you really need an enemy for a war to work. But like's happening in the Ukraine, figuring out a way to protect people right now while this battle rages until it finally burns itself out and there's there's an, another future. I, I just hope that's where we are. But I see these people who are just being ca becoming casualties uh, in this. And, um, uh, you know, for, for a lot of people, they're like, hey, I just don't want to get all political about this. And, you know, when people say that is when they don't have a person that they can attach to it. Right. They don't have someone that cares about the issue. They think they're being political about it, you know, because it is it's an or I think what people mean by political often is I don't want to become all issue oriented about this. Um, and, and that's the difference between personally engaged and issue driven, you know, uh, mm -hmm. scroll, you know, social media scroll issue driven. Like, what's the next thing I'm supposed to be outraged about? I just don't want to go down that road. Well, yeah, if you don't know anybody who's transgender and that doesn't affect you. Um, hey, can, can, I want to ask you this one last thing. I've been surprised, you know, I was a pastor at a church in Minneapolis for 20 years and I've been done there for a couple of years. And I've been surprised by the number of el now elementary school kids who are part of that community that are now like fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade. And how many of them are now expressing <clears throat> that they see themselves as transgender? I was there for 20 years. There was no one I knew who as an elementary school child talked about that. N now a group of kids who are all around, you know, for a lot of the years that I was there are now saying, hey, I see myself in, in, a, in a different gender lens and I'm exploring transgender. Do you have any thoughts about that? Are you seeing that too? Like, is there some cultural move that's either opening the door for people to express what's really happening or... Is there some social pressure that's pushing kids to consider something they might not always? Do you have thoughts about that at, at all? I know we only have a couple minutes left, but just wonder if you have um, thoughts on yeah, that. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm going to jump back just for a second to what you were saying before. The most recent study indicated that um, only 36% of evangelical Christians are supportive of marriage equality, but 51% of millennials and Gen Z are supportive of marriage equality, 51% of evangelical. Christians in those age groups. So yes, it's inexorably moving in a particular direction. When we see what's happening right now with kids, it's been what's happening with kids forever. I mean, the uh, family mm. systems folks call it differentiation. The Jungians call it individuation. Uh, you're trying to figure out who you are and you need to separate from your family of origin. And now it's become more acceptable to do that by exploring your gender identity. I imagine we'll discover that by the time somebody hits 30 years of age, we'll still realize that about 0.58% of the population is transgender. Mm. But we're going to see far higher numbers in the teen years. It's like, for instance, uh, uh -huh. some recent studies indicate that 62% of those who identify as gender non-binary are between um, uh, 13 and 26 years of age. Well, that tells us something. We're not sure exactly what it tells us, but it definitely tells us something. And so I think we want to pay attention to that. So how much of this is in fact core to identity and how much of this is uh, just maturational development? And um, there are ways that as a therapist, I can identify someone who is likely to still present as transgender at age 30 as they are at age 12. Um, and the ones that are likely not. But I don't know that it's helpful to, um, to those people to know which category they fall into. I think it's important for them to be able to do their exploration. Mm -hmm. And to, um, you know, I say to parents all the time, if their child wants to be known as a, by a non-binary name or their child wants to be known by a name of the opposite gender, uh, than, than the one identified in their birth certificate, uh, I, I say, yeah, okay, all right. I mean, it'll all work itself out. I mean, you don't have to really be concerned about that. It will, in fact, work itself out. Our identity always does. And so I think the biggest thing I say there is just don't lose a lot of sleep over this. 
Um, one thing you can say with some confidence is a child who has consistently and persistently from the time they were first able to speak uh, declared that they are the gender not identified in their birth certificate, that child is transgender and will always be transgender. If it's 12 or 13 year old that suddenly is telling you that, well, now it gets a lot more complicated. Hmm. Well, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's part of the complexity of, of how we uh, as human beings live, you know, and yep. it's been hard to, hard to know what our societies have, have restricted and what our society and, and would naturally be there without social pressure and what our society is demanding of people that wouldn't be there without social pressure. You know, it's just, and whether it's in the issues that we're talking about today or a lot of other issues, you know, there's just a whole lot of things that, um, make you wonder. Uh, it used to matter to me a lot for some reason. I didn't, I don't know why, I guess I had sort of a naturalist determinative view of the world. Like, well, if it's, if the desire or drive is there by nature, it's okay. But if it's there by social influence, then it's not. And I've kind of gotten to the point where like, I'm not sure I can always tell exactly where the blend of which ingredients is which they're, I, I don't know, because these are all social constructs. Uh, there, there's one question that Mike puts in here. Um, and if you have another minute, do you, do you have another minute for sure. this r rather long question from, from Mike uh, in, the, in the comment? Um, Mike says, hey, I, I have a question. Uh, please tell me if I'm out of place here. Why does gender identification seem to sometimes require the medical manipulation of one's body and hormones to conform to society's interpretation of what it means to be male or female? Can someone just identify with their true feelings within their body they were born in? Simply put, can Jim just live with the feelings of Janet as he or she is? Why do so many individual individuals fight with the natural body image that they already own? Can our physical appearance, appearance created as it is find the freedom to be as it is. And I know you've talked a lot about body relationship to identity and so on. So I, I know you're, you know, it's a long question. Well, there's, and a um, but I know no, uh, there's a medical answer to that. Um, we don't know with any certainty what causes someone to be transgender. Our best understanding from the studies that have been done currently is that it is something that happens prenatally and happens in the second trimester. So what happens for most transgender people is that there is a great, great disconnect between the body that has been created and the brain's understanding of and connection to that body. So for instance, there's a rare condition where people will experience a limb of their body as a foreign object. And mm. it's highly distressing to them. Um, you know, if, if you had a log sticking out of your chest, um, your brain would be telling you all day, every day, hey, there's a log sticking out of your chest. Mm. Well, for this subset of the population, that's how they experience an arm or a leg. Mm. And if you or I lose an arm or a leg, well, what makes a prosthetic device work is that our brain still thinks it's there because it will have a phantom limb. These people, if they lose that arm or leg that their brain has never identified as being a part of the body, they do not have a phantom limb. In fact, the brain is finally happy. The brain says, I told you all along that wasn't supposed to be there. Thank you, but it's no longer there. Well, we understand that it's likely the same thing with transgender people. The body that is created, we all begin as females in the womb and then half of us get an androgen wash that turns the fetus male. That happens in the first trimester. The third trimester, however, is when the brain develops its connection to the body that has been created. Oh. And so the assumption is that something has happened in the second trimester that has caused the brain to not be nice. uh, able to make a connection to the body that has been created. So for instance, uh, we know that those of us who had mothers who took um, um, well, all of a sudden I forgot the name of it. Um, I think it's called DNS, uh, to stop pregnancies, which was a common thing given between 1930 and 1970. We have a 30% higher chance of being transgender 
of the oh. population at large. And so we know that that medication uh, likely caused some something to happen in the brain during the second trimester that caused the brain not to develop a connection to the body that developed. And so the answer to your person's question is no. Um, it's not as simple as just saying, I will live that way. It is in fact a strong disconnect mm. uh, to, the, to that body. Yeah. Mm. Paula, your wisdom, your insight, your memory of quotable phrases is uh, inspiring and great. Thank you so much. And thanks, uh, thanks everybody on the, on the chat and those who are um, listening in. We just really appreciate all of it. So um, I don't know. Uh, may we find a way to treat each other better and especially these transgender kids. And I just encourage everyone to not stay quiet on this, um, to bring it up and to raise it as an issue that the civic and legal moves to make life on transgendered people in the United States more difficult um, is a bad thing. And we should not do that. that, that's, that that's, a, that's a chosen path we should not take. And uh, especially those, because look, you can think it's only, you know, a governor in Texas and a governor in Florida. That's, that's not how our society and politics works. Yep. Uh, those are, those are big testing grounds for these ideas and they will continue. They will continue to spread and we have to stay, stay engaged on them. Uh, so Paula, thank you. It, my pleasure as always being with you. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Bye everybody. We'll, uh, we'll be back with you tomorrow.